Now you should have gotten the recording. So hi everyone. Let's um, let's slowly but surely start the session. So my name is Ricardo, um, and with Laura, we are your hosts from Echolis for the day on this session on fundraising capacity building. So we'll keep the an introduction short. So basically for a long time that we realized that there's a strong need and desire from from our various members and the organizations that we work with to yeah to get better at fundraising it's uh it's maybe not the most pleasant topic but it's a necessary one so this is our first attempt at bringing a few topics of fundraising into one session and to have a and to have a proper discussion about it um so yeah so we hope this session will be useful that it uh, strikes the imagination and it helps us to continue to do the work that we are already doing so on so yeah most of you already know Echolis, um and and why we do what we do so i'll skip that um and just to give you a bit of an overview of what we expect from the session so <clears throat> essentially we figure out why we're here, essentially what we're doing now. We have a small group check-in in small groups, um, in breakout groups, that's what I mean. And then we go deep into the content. So that's gonna be a heavy content session where all the guest speakers are gonna speak about a certain component of fundraising. We will start with a, with a case study and then go very specifically into different sources of fundraising. Um, then we will have a, a bit of time for a big group reflection um, throughout throughout the, the presentation. There will be time for Q&A. At the end, there will be more time for Q&A with everyone. And, um, at the, and, and then after that big group shared reflection and learnings, we will also invite you to, we'll create a little space in breakout groups um, to again going to the different topics that we presented so to have a to still have time to go a little bit more deep into the different topics and take notes of um of essentially what is the what is the the purpose of this session we want you not just to learn but to figure out how we work together so so yeah so it's you're not just supposed to be a, a listening participant but also okay let's do projects together and let's figure out how to get money for them that would be an intention so I think in terms of uh, introducing the session, that's all that needs to be said for now. And I would pass it to Laura also to complete if I've missed something. All right, yes, thank you, Ricardo. I see we have a bunch more people that have joined in the meantime. So also just a quick welcome to all of you. I'm so glad you're joining us. Um, I think this is gonna be a really exciting session as Ricardo said about building our capacity as fundraising. And also just to say, I see this really as an opportunity for, for shared learning and dialogue. <laughs> we have some guest speakers who have some expertise. They, they will share around the topic of fundraising and different pathways of strategies that have enabled them to raise also bring in the, the money to power activities that we feel passionate about doing but it is also a space for anybody here um, in the audience to participate to bring your press questions to bring your experiences or and your challenges related to fundraising so we can be a really co-creative um, space full of learning for for all of us that's what i'm looking forward to um so thank you all for making the time you know this afternoon to join us I'm excited for this and um, to start out um, with a little um, check in and an introduction I'm going to move you into breakout groups as well and um, I'm, the main thing is I'm going to ask you two questions for for the exchange in your little group and then after I will also invite you to um, write like a kind of a, a short response to these questions in a, uh, in a mentee meter and a breakout sessions but first i want to give you an opportunity to also meet some of the people here and um, the question i'm putting it in the chat now so this is the kind of thematic um, questions for the check-in so what would you like to learn from this fundraising session 
And do you have specific projects or activities that you would really like to fundraise for? So these are, are gonna be the two questions for you to explore in your little groups as a check-in, and then we'll harvest some of the different perspectives for the whole group also in the, in the online tool after. Um, so when you come into your groups, you have a few minutes time um, to you know, speak with the people there. It's gonna be around three people in each breakout session. You can you know, quickly also say your name, organization, country, to have a bit of perspective, and then um, focus on the, on the questions. Uh, I'll ask you to make sure that everybody has come back. All right. Okay, let me just set the timing. We're gonna do, yeah, we're gonna do six minutes. So in the trios, it will be two minutes per person to answer those questions, introduce yourself briefly. So I'll open the room now and um, I'll, I'll, I'll see you after again. Hello. Hello. Um, sorry for my delay. I've only just joined, so I come straight into a breakout room, so I don't know what's happening. Oh, okay. Me neither. I arrived now. Excellent. Maybe Isa and Angela can tell us what's happening. Okay. Hello. Can somebody else tell us what's happening? Maybe we're in the late room. 
you know what what is the topic that we are talking about here, Rosalinda? Uh, yes, the fundraising, um, how to um, how to say how to support uh, um, ecologic um, community building, right? Last two minutes. How to support the ecological? I know this is the topic, uh, but uh, I don't know if we have to talk about something uh, or I don't Could know. Could you? Would you like to share? Because no one else appears to be off off silent. I would like to hear what your what's your perspective. My perspective about uh, this topic. <laughs> Actually, I was thinking that was a, a kind of a meeting where uh, people could share uh, how to do it, Lisa. And so uh, I don't really know uh, how could be. I think, um, uh, especially alternative lifestyle, like. Uh, mm, Lead, try to to buy food um, from the um, people that work directly in the not in supermarkets uh, but uh, in uh, uh, from people that work in the land. Mm -hmm. For me, this is a, a kind of um, ecologic lifestyle to support. Uh, them in the in the system, and not uh, buying food in the supermarket that uh, is uh, from everywhere in the world, and um, a lot of time I I know that uh, there is a lot in waste food, uh, so for me it's something uh, uncurrent uh, that there are people that doesn't have uh, uh, money to buy food and then uh, uh, thank you okay. where is everyone We're all here. I think we're coming back to the main main room. I think we're all in the main room already. Well, at least a lot of us. Oh. All right. Welcome back, everyone, from the little check-in rounds and break. <laughs> Welcome. You haven't missed much. Uh, and I'm happy you're, you're joining us for this session on fundraising capacity building as part of our Communities for Future um, activities. And um, maybe, actually, Ricardo, you can stop the screen share. So we'll just a moment to actually see everyone in gallery view. It's great. If you're able to have your video on, that's beautiful. You can also put your name, organization, you know, rename yourself on Zoom. So we get a bit of a picture of who's here. 34 people at the moment. Um, thank you all for, for joining us. And um, yeah, that's some time for introductions uh, and breakout sessions. But I will also post, um, so even if, you, if you've if you joined the breakouts, but even if you couldn't, um, please take a moment now to follow this link on menti.com and you'll be able to, to briefly share a few key words um, around the two questions that we asked. Are there any projects or activities that you would like to raise for? Ah, we actually have a different question there as well. <laughs> uh, your capacity and experience. 
uh, in each of the funding types that will be today. So yeah, if you go to the list, take a minute or two to answer the questions. Okay, I hope you have some time to submit your answers and then I can share my screen. We can take a brief look. Okay. All right, so this is the one for the first question where we would like to learn. See, people wanna learn about entrepreneurship, experiences to network, contacts, inspirations, connections, possibilities, identify different funding sources, build community, Learn how to earn more income, more about crowdfunding, good practices from others, network or Erasmus, case studies. All right, more about money, make links, learn some basics, learn some tools, learn some strategies. All right, so we have a bunch of different things that people are curious of learning. Um, let's see uh, what we can cover. And I also invite you to bring, you know, your questions into the interactive spaces that will be opening. So you can make sure that you're actively engaged to be, you know, learning the different things that you care about most. Um, yeah, let's see. Should be able to go also to the next. I'm going to share the second one as well. Second question. All right. So this is about the capacity and experience that people here in the space with us currently have. So what I can see here that there's quite a bit of skills with um, Erasmus Plus projects. A little bit less, but also decent on crowdfunding earned income. And then philanthropy and horizon projects scored the least. So I think Ricardo, <laughs> your piece of the per presentation will be well received. And in general, I mean, we can see that based on ours, I mean, you know, just a quick self-assessment, there's a lot of room to gain more capacity and skills and experience with fundraising. Since even the highest, you know, it's just 4.8 um, from a total of possible 10, I think that I put on the scale. So there's there's room to grow and to learn together. So this is exciting, and to yeah to cover some of these different topics. Also, just to mention briefly, we've put philanthropy here because it's a, can be a really powerful source to access funding. Um, unfortunately, the guest speakers that we invited they couldn't make it at this time, so we're skipping on this piece of the presentation for today. But uh, maybe in a future um, session, um, kind of a continuation. Definitely see that the, the level of skills is not so high, so it might be worthwhile to come back to this at a later point. All right. Well, thank you all for participating participating in this little uh, check-in and assessment. And um, now we're going to move into uh, a part of the session to hear presentations from our guest speakers. Um, so we're first going to hear from Davy Philip. I'm, I'm not going to go into details of introduction. I think it makes 
make sense for you to share a few words anyways, because you also bring, you know, your experience there, but then also your um, specific case study um, and, and experience with uh, raising funds and, and earning income through different activities. And then we're also going to have Ricardo um, from Ecoli speaking about the Horizon projects. And then we have a, a shared presentation of Camila and Dario speaking about Erasmus Plus, as well as Maurizio, who's joined us to um, for today. And um, the speakers are going to share, you know, some information about um, how to obtain these type of funds, how or when it could be used, or maybe some pros and cons. Um, of these different types of fundraising and also share any kind of best practices or advice uh, tools or lessons that they've learned um, on a kind of practical how-to um, that can be helpful for other people in their fundraising efforts. And if you have some insights or time for Q&As um, as well, and then later on in the session, um, as we introduced an overview, there will be also a, a longer time period to go into breakout sessions um, on each of those four areas and be able to, you know, ask more specific questions to the speakers and explore and learn in more detail. All right, I think this is good uh, for an introduction. So I will hand it over to Davy. Um, we're going to take about 10 minutes each for the presentations and then um, David, you're welcome to start. Thanks, Laura, and thanks, Ecolise, for having me. So I'm Davy Phillip. I'm from the Sustainable Ireland Co-op. We formed in 2000 as a number of practitioners who wanted to create their income through sustainability. Uh, we call ourselves Cultivate um, because we had a centre called that. And um, we've been working for a long time on progressing a community-led approach to sustainability uh, through different courses, events, publications, uh, exhibits and festivals that we can earn our own income through. Uh, and really, we believe in a sort of regenerative community-led approach uh, to making the transition we need to make. So I'm going to give a short presentation with a number of areas, uh, managing our centre, events and conferences, festivals, training and capacity building, research and local climate coaching. These are ways that we earn our income. Next slide, please. So we've managed since the early noughties um, sustainable living and learning centers. Uh, so we started in the former, uh, a former church and school in the cultural quarter of Dublin. Um, where we um, were running a week-long festival and we took over, it was a museum space that wasn't being used and we got it for very cheap rent. It had large conference rooms, exhibit space. We had a shop there, had a permaculture garden and we ran it for um, almost seven years. Uh, and then we ran another centre in Dublin, which was the former government centre for in, in environment, uh, which was getting closed down and we were invited to take it over. And with other NGOs, we ran that for a few years. It had offices, events and training spaces. It also had a shop on the ground floor and exhibit space. And from that centre, we ran a labour market activation programme on the green economy. We currently are based in Weekly 8, which is a community enterprise centre in Clock Jordan Eco Village, which has events and training spaces, co-working. Uh, it has now a food hub with a digital farmer's market using the open food network platform. And it has a digital fabrication workshop, a fab lab. Um, all of these uh, and our current centre have different ways of bringing income in. Next slide, please. So I'll just look at some of the pros and cons uh, and how that might be used by other community-led initiatives or Ecolise members. I think centres can be set up at different scales and we're seeing a lot of need to repurpose the derelict shops or empty shops on high streets. There's an opportunity, I think, for groups to take over that and run some sort of centre offering training and products and potentially uh, acting as a driver for your own economy. The cons can be staffing needs if you're running a shop, for instance. Uh, we did run a shop in Dublin uh, with ESC volunteers for a long time, uh, and that uh, income from the shop helped um, fund the centre. Uh, so um, high overhead sometimes as rents go up, 
Um, so depending on the scale, this can be very difficult. The advantages can be it can really facilitate a diverse income stream, especially around the design and delivery of events, which is what we've done since for the last 20 years. We've probably had thousands of events now, and I'll touch on that. And having a centre has really allowed us to both organise those events and conferences, but also to disseminate our message, to have a Main Street sort of uh, shop front to actually sell our ideas, not just eco products. Next slide, please. Another area we look at in managing our earned income is the main one, which is events and conferences. So we have earned uh, a large percentage of our income through the design and delivery uh, of workshops, trainings, conferences. I'm giving you a selection here. So in the early noughties, we ran a number of green building conferences that brought a new emerging sustainable construction sector together. Uh, that supported the formation of the Irish Green Building Council, which still exists today. Uh, we still do Feeding Ourselves, which is an annual gathering of regenerative, cooperative and local food initiatives. Uh, that has um, been going now for over a decade. It supported uh, the formation of OFN Ireland, the Open Food Network, CSA Ireland, the Community Supported uh, Agriculture Association, and uh, Tal of Beal, which is our Regenerate Farmers Network. And they're the key stakeholders in this annual event. It's also led to the formation of a community of practice, uh, which is another thing that we've been looking at. Uh, and we now have a community of practice called Feeding Ourselves, where we have 20 Irish networks, and we get funded by an, a semi-state organization to provide training and capacity building to a sector that is not represented well by other training institutes in Ireland. So um, we do something similar for housing ourselves. So that is a annual event for advocates of community land trusts and co-housing initiatives. Uh, and um, that's really led, that led um, to uh, a lot of work uh, last year um, on researching uh, community-led housing. And then um, we now have been funded for next year to do a spatial practitioner retreat, an artist retreat, to progress the ideas of um, sustainable neighborhood and uh, leading to an event and a publication. Stories and Conversations is an event we took around the country. Uh, it's, it's a short event based on World Cafe, where it's ignited by short stories from different organizations, community-led initiatives, and then into a conversation around provocative questions. Uh, and then we do, for the last two years, quite a lot of blended deep dive webinars. Uh, so using our digital studio, we have a digital studio with multi cameras and microphones. Uh, we've designed and delivered webinars and um, online education and blended. So you have physical and online participants for different institutions. Next slide, please. Um, so what's uh, the pros and cons of this? Well, this is a common way for us to disseminate our ideas, but also to earn income on ticket sales or, or fund or sponsorship. It can be supported uh, in a number of different ways. Um, what are the pros and cons? Well, if you're not got a sponsor, you have to do the outreach and ticket sales, which can be nerve wracking in this climate where people don't come to things anymore or don't pay for things anymore. So it's always good to just get a sponsor and they pay and take the risk for you designing and delivering the event. And even an event can have many income streams. You might have um, tables sponsored by relevant institutions or companies. You may have um, uh, stage branding or, or signage um, from uh, these sort of companies bring you extra income. And I, I think that our networks uh, the transition, the permaculture eco village, and the community-led networks have a lot of a, um, a lot of history and experience in running inclusive and participative events. And I think there's going to be a scramble now. Uh, we see it in Ireland for community-led climate action. There's going to be a scramble to engage citizens in more and uh, participative ways. And I think we have a our movement has a, a good potential for that. Next slide, please. So festivals is something we um, started with. We started in the 2000s um, holding an annual festival called Convergence Sustainable Living Festival. Um, when we first started, it would have 100 events over a week. 
and with all sorts of arts, film, conferences, lectures. Um, and we, we did it for 20 years, ending up taking it around the country. This had many income streams, uh, especially key sponsors uh, and uh, different stakeholders uh, who would pay for um, visibility or to support what you're doing. Global Green is something that we do for the largest music festival. We get paid to, uh, by the organizer to bring 300 activists from 30 community-led initiatives and organizations around Ireland, and we create a pop-up eco-village in the festival. And that three days there gives us access to up to 80,000 eyes, uh, therefore has got potential for additional sponsorship. We've had sponsorship to promote the sustainable development goals or uh, other sustainability measures, maybe from the government or for local authorities in that festival. And then we started a festival here in Clock Jordan Eco Village this year called Elements of Change. That hasn't been as successful on finding funding, or but we do it because we know it's got potential. So festivals is a way for us as, uh, to earn us some income. Next slide, please. So uh, this can be a powerful way to disseminate your message, especially if you get funded to go to someone else's festival that's large. Um, uh, also networking, we bring 300 activists. That's great networking over three days. In fact, it's more when we're, when we're working there. So that's brilliant networking and lots of multiple sources of income there. What are the pros and cons? It can be time consuming. It can take, it can take a lot of energy, it can be draining. Uh, but the, uh, the pros are, it's really good for delivering uh, awareness and making money. And then um, maybe the best practice there that large festivals everywhere now want to highlight sustainability. It could be quite easy uh, for a group of um, community led initiatives in a country to approach a festival and say, we'll do an eco or a sustainability area at your festival, can you pay us? Okay, next slide, please. Almost finished. So training capacity building is something we've done for a long time. We started with community power down, supporting transition towns. It was a 10, 10 module training um, program that we couldn't find funding for and then found out the, the Broadcasting Commission of Ireland were looking for community television ideas. So we re, uh, reworded our proposal for our training and we got funding to make a 10 part TV show that's been broadcast in over 16 countries now, and we have it on a DVD, but we use it in our training. Um, we, we then did a train the trainers course um, that has um, people deliver that themselves. We still do a lot of facilitation training. We train uh, different activist groups and, and organizations, but we also work with semi-states. So we recently did our local authority water program. Uh, they have animators around the country. And then recently we did training for communities called Communities for Climate Action for leader companies. So we've been paid uh, for three leader companies now to provide training in their regions to help citizens understand the climate crisis and to um, be inspired by projects they might be able to apply for money for. And then we did greener communities training funded by our local authority um, to localize the sustainable development goals. So there's... Training and capacity building, I think, could be the bread and butter for a lot of our community-led initiatives. Next slide, please. Almost there. So what's a, the, what's a, what does this way of funding, how could it work? It's a good way to really achieve your mission. So to disseminate the ideas and to train more people and to raise funds. The cons, the cons again, is if you're um, not funded to deliver it, you have to get the ticket sales and outreach, which can take time and staff time. And um, the pros are there's a big demand for this now, right across from different institutions, local authorities, local development companies, leader companies. There's a big demand for this sort of training now. We're in a good position to deliver that, our movement. And best practices, it's easier if you design and deliver the training for specific demographics uh, that an institution might pay for. Um, but it's also easy to offer that yourself and sell tickets. Next slide, please. So research, just as the last sort of area, um, we've done quite a bit of research, both for our National Environmental Network, uh, research on the new CAP programme. We've also done research funded by our Green European Foundation and Green Foundation Ireland around um, local economies and supply chains. 
And we did a, a year long process through a community of practice of road mapping community led housing. So there's many ways either to drive or be a part of research that often can pay you. Next slide, please. The last piece I just wanted to mention is someone we're working on with Equal East members across Europe, the climate coach, climate community climate coaches. Well, we've taken that finishes next spring, uh, and Equal East is a partner in that, and all the partners are Equal East members. But we've just been funded. We've just started um, with our two local development companies and our public participation network to test, validate, and roll out the local climate coaching training in our, uh, our region in Tipperary with the intention, once we've piloted it, we'd roll out across the country. And again, uh, every local authority is grasping at how they do local community climate action. And I think um, building the capacity of the facilitators, the animators and trainers to do that uh, will make it much more effective. That's me, I, I think. So I went over time slightly and hopefully the questions we'll have opportunities to dive into. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Davy, for such a rich, full presentation. I'm glad we have the slides recording to follow up on some of these details. And thank you for bringing very practical examples um, from this case study um, of, of, of Clock Jordan and Cultivate in Ireland. Um, if there's one question now, um, if somebody has something in the chat, um, you, can, you can ask this before we move forward to the next um, presentation. I think I, I saw something about a question, if you do have a sponsorship template, but you can share like another, just a sentence or two of how you approach sponsorship. I think it's a case by case uh, approach. You, you can have a cookie cutter template here. Um, if you're attracting sponsors to your event, or if you want to uh, create an opportunity for sponsorship, I think it really depends on the sector. Uh, but I would keep it short, keep it simple, and really show the impact that someone will have if they sponsor your event. All right, thank you. So I'll hand it over to you, Ricardo, to continue. Thank you. So we go from all the topics to focus on one very specific topic, and perhaps the one that's the one of the most challenging ones, at least if we look at them. Um, we look at the um, at the Mentimeter before. So um, the slides that I have uh, are supposed to be very uh, are intended to be very simple, but they probably will not answer everything. Um, so yeah, let me try and say my piece, and we'll be we can be open to questions and figure out how how we go from there. Um, so yeah, so uh, first off, so uh, myself, uh, I've worked with. Um, with EU Horizon projects, which is one form of research projects. And uh, in this case, I'm just going to talk about these projects in general. Uh, I think it's more fair to say that it's research projects as a whole. They tend to work like this, particularly if they if they are EU funded. Uh, there's other similar sources and so on. But uh, these are the ones that I know the best that I've worked on for now, uh, I think, a decade or so. Um, and yeah, so what um, the, the main facts about these usual projects is that they have relatively large budgets. So I, research projects, I've seen very few that, that are smaller than a million, unless they're, they're hyper-local. Um, they usually want you to involve um, a bunch of partners, whether it's universities, local actors, or disseminators, or something like this. And they, they last for a couple of years. And one of the things that tends to uh, put people away from them, with good reason, is that they ask for a very long proposal that is that is just overwhelming and overly bureaucratic. And honestly, it serves no no real purpose. But it, that is the the hoops that we must go through to uh, to reach these funds. Um, so yeah. So one, what is maybe what is relevant to say um, and more relevant for us as real people is that these projects uh, maybe are a little bit different from others because they want they want to have some kind of some some output that feeds 
uh, research and innovation. So that could be academic papers, that could be a formal set of policy recommendations. So you can imagine reports um, and physical outputs that you can present at the end and say, hey, we worked for these years and these were, this was the intelligence that we put forward into something. And more and more, they are shifting, uh, probably because of all this startup nonsense that infiltrates our world. Uh, they want more and more actual prototypes to be at the end. This is something that I will get to a little bit later because I think it works to our advantage. Because while um, a lot of traditional funders want us to do technology, we can do better than that and present what actually works in real life. So show that a prototype can be a living space, for example. But so yeah, so they uh, so in, in on paper, um, the people that offer the money they want uh, academics to be involved, and you know more institutional partners. However, that doesn't mean that there is not space for other types of uh, organization. I'll get into that. Um, the biggest trends that we can see right now is is that um, more and more the the research um, pots of money that show up. They, they are allocating more money, they are recognizing a little bit more the importance of community participation or participatory processes like local democracy processes and so on. Um, transition is a big topic. Um, it's not just, um, it's not just um, basically climate technology, but actual transition processes. And that's super broad and super interesting and super relevant for, you know, with the whole climate crisis thing. Um, and, uh, and of course, it must be said that nature-based solutions is also um, a big topic. So the more that we can frame what we do in these terms, it's, it makes it much easier to access this money. From our side, the, usually the role that we try to find in these kind of research projects as Ecolis um, is to be facilitators of communities of practice. So essentially to, um, to make a translation between all the academics and the policy people um, and the engineers and so on with the actual work that is done on the ground. So basically trying to, to, to essentially get the input from the experts or get the support of the so-called experts into people doing actual work. That's what, what we try to do because very often we find uh, that, uh, that the institutional players do not know the initiatives and if left alone, they will choose the wrong people. Uh, they will choose the wrong people to work with and they will do the approach wrong and it's just not good for anyone. Um, and so we try to make this to make a better communication between the two. And in general, we find that this is a role that makes sense when um, when writing such a project. What I would like to maybe call more your attention to today is that what would be helpful for us to get involved in research projects which will benefit you is to be able to every time be better able to identify what are the people doing in the different networks because we know lots of uh, lots of initiatives are doing amazing things but the communication of what's going on is also is all is not always so easy and and yeah and it's maybe not as organized as um as we would like it to be so essentially um we would like to be able to pinpoint exactly like okay so in these countries uh, we know these people who are doing who are doing fantastic things related to sustainable building, or they are doing transition plans with the municipality, and it's and it, and that's very interesting. They have a methodology on how to do the transition, or perhaps they've been using some kind of um, nature-based solution for flood protection, etc. And the more that we understand this, the more it is easier to justify why community-led initiatives should be part of research projects, and then essentially. Um, yeah, let the, get the funding to the people doing the actual work. So yeah, so it's a mix of basically thematic area work and specialized services. So from methodologies um, to let's say work on the grounds on the thematic areas. So essentially this is what from we as Equalies we are usually trying to do when we design, uh, when we are part of designing research projects. Let's see, um, yeah, so essentially, I sort of repeat uh, what I already said a, a little bit that um, that yeah that, that we are excited to to help create uh, a research project that have to do with um, with funding specialized communities of practice. Uh, they don't have to be just on those technical uh, aspects. They could just, they could also be on um, on social components, for example, transition plans. 
Um, we are also very um, eager to fund projects that actually evaluate the impact of community-led initiatives, because this is something that it's good for all of us that uh, in your community that if we can get if we can get a standardized way of assessing uh, the good impact that you have in your in your place and then we can use that to be part of policy recommendations the impact could be super cool but to do a proper evaluation we need the funding so we need to have you know we have the chicken and egg problem and like i said uh, so not only we, uh, we are looking forward to funding the communities of practice but actually to get the money to the projects on the on the ground uh, and yeah, transition initiatives I already mentioned. I could swear I changed the slides a little bit. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, so uh, trying to do a too long didn't listen uh, because this guy rambles too much. Uh, so the overall, the pros and cons of, of uh, research projects or Horizon projects is there's a lot of money, lots of big institutions. You get a uh, you get recognition. You get to work with um, yeah with some good partners uh, and with some very high visibility partners, and they tend to be very in, well at least EU wide um, impacts, so to say. Uh, the cons is that yeah you depend on the institutional partners, and it can be a high amount of work to get it and to understand how it works. So. To get into a little bit of, um, to try to be quicker, um, we'll also have the slides. M my professional recommendation is don't look at a Horizon project or a research project and try to come up new to fit what they are asking for. This is a waste of time. A uh, writing a proposal or main part of a proposal takes a lot of energy and a lot, a lot of time, especially if you don't have experience. It's much better to you know, it, you could go through us or you could go through another organization that already has experience and offer a piece that you are already doing or that you could just be doing, you know, you could be, you could have a lot of work in, um, in sustainable building and you could be running a community of practice uh, across Europe because you know the topic and you can just host online meetings, you, you know, that could make sense. And then it's easy for someone who has experience in uh, participating in these projects to essentially host you. Um, give you access to the funding without much, most of the administrative nonsense, which is honestly, it's hell if you haven't done it before. So that's my essentially my, my main thing to say, that if you're new, try to focus on one thing that you're already doing, justify to someone that that should be part of the project, uh, and yeah, and then you get the experience from there. This, um, so at, while trying to get a project, my recommendation is really to have a clear positioning of what you could do. So, for example, in my case, I'm a, so yeah, or probably most people like me who, who do these proposals, we are words people. So we need like one paragraph of like, what would you do? What is your role? What's, uh, what is something that I can send to the rest of the institutional people and be like, I have 10 people who do these things and I have a paragraph for each one and all together I can build a story of why the world will be better because of this. And one thing that is very uh, that I that I really recommend is when joining such a project, know your boundaries. Don't try to do everything because one day a researcher will tell you, "Hey, it'd be super cool if you participate in this working group." And by the way, if you organize a session every week, and also actually if you can provide us input on that, and then very quickly, yeah, no, it's know what you're doing know um and make it very clear at the proposal writing phase that you will only do a certain task because otherwise you might win a project and then suddenly you committed to doing a lot more things than you are actually able to do but yeah that's always you know it's like life establishing boundaries um and yeah and the final uh, final thing to say unless i'm forgetting uh no not the final thing um like I said, it is normal that the proposals are overwhelming. Um, so again, try to establish boundaries when trying to, to work for them. Do, don't think, don't put all your eggs in one basket. It is very unlikely that you will, that a proposal is successful. So I recommend to have a clear position, a clear thing that you want to do, and then approach different research opportunities and say, hey, we would like to do this. If you fit us in your project, that's cool. And then basically you have the pos you have the role that you wanna do inserted into multiple proposals. And then the work that you do is much more effective uh, because you put effort into multiple applications instead of one, you don't depend on it. 
and anyway you wanted to do that uh, anyway and if you don't get funding from that at least you learn and you know and you learn something about your position um and on the other spectrum of the recommendation when thinking about a project uh, your role and positioning about being in a in a proposal don't worry about if you have one person to start to work next week because the work will never start next week it will start in six months or a year and you'll have enough budget to hire a dedicated team so you don't need to have everything figured out at the time you just need to have a bit of a vision that is clear and i feel like i'm taking already too much time so basically the um, yeah the i'll leave you with the message that i know this is overwhelming uh we uh well what we try to do is that through Equalises networks we and channels we try to be very specific on this uh, on the request that we launch our members hey we're looking for people who are doing uh you know sustainable building transition plans or something um we try to share this on social media on newsletter wherever it fits we try to understand our members so that we know who to approach directly when an opportunity comes up so we try to make it to filter it and make it easier to participate um but we're not the only ones doing it so also feel free um to get in touch with people who are doing very well in uh, in research projects um and yeah and that's usually a much easier start than uh, than any other way so i think that uh, i feel like i already said a lot all right yeah, yeah. thank you ricardo um for a, a, a quick rundown on, on, on some of the basics and opportunities when it comes to reach research and horizon projects thanks for sharing your experience uh, i did catch one is funding from anywhere in the world maybe that is something you can quickly answer also if there's another quick question post it in the chat now um, but i'll hand it to you ricardo to just answer this one that came in throughout the presentation yeah super quickly um that's a that's a yes and no it really depends on the um, on the part of funding and um but yeah, we gotta yeah to answer this question, we would have to get into technical stuff. So, um, for most EU types of funding, uh, there's a list of associated countries who who might who get funding under certain rules, and the one uh, the ones who are not considered associated countries, they can't get it. But there's always exceptions, and it really depends on on how things are organized. Um, so yeah, but I would say in non-EU countries, yeah, or non-EU countries that don't have, that are not considered associated countries, that's yeah, I would say find if, yeah, talk to us directly, um, and we can see if it works or not. But it's most likely don't don't think there's a big opportunity. Okay, thank you for clarifying that, and um, I suggest we'll take a short break now before we go into the other two presentations, also to have a quick mental space uh, or a bio break if you need it. So um, let's just take a break for, let's say four or five minutes and then reconvene here and we'll dive into the Erasmus Plus and the crowdfunding presentations and then more interactive session after. So I hope you can join us for the remaining of the session. It'll be quite exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you in a bit. Right, welcome back after the short break. So we're going to dive into our second part of uh, presentations, um, looking at Erasmus Plus project next with Camilla and also Dario, who are both um, as connected with uh, Gen Europe. So they'll be sharing a few different opportunities for using um, the Erasmus Plus funding. In their work, and then we're gonna close up with uh, Mauricio on crowdfunding. So, Dario, Camilla, you can take it away here. Yeah, I will start, and uh, Camilla will take it from me later. So, yeah, uh, it's um, I'm I'm taking it from here. Uh, the, I see that there were already a few people knowing at least a bit about Erasmus Plus. So, I hope. This will uh, also support uh, support us to be on the same page and clarify our ideas. Also, because Erasmus Plus, it's really quite a big program that has a lot of different opportunities and a lot of different actions. is actually one of the biggest programs of the European Union in terms of budget, 
It has more than 26.2 billions for this programming period that goes until 2027. And also in terms of impact, uh, as there are more than 10 millions of people expected to participate also until 2027. And uh, is uh, a program that, uh, let's say, is, whose main focus is uh, education in many different sectors, higher school education, vocational training, adult education, youth and sports as well as, a, I mean, as an additional thing. Can you show the next one, please? Yeah, thanks. So it's focused on learning mobilities, the idea that uh, people to, uh, want to learn something and they travel to, uh, another, to another place, either physically or lately also, there was this innovation that, also, that gave us also the possibility to travel virtually it's through online, online or blended learning um, in, to projects, to activities that uh, are related uh, in the case of adult and youth education, adult and youth uh, with non informal and non formal education. Uh, the good thing about the Erasmus pro projects uh, of Erasmus program compared to other kind of a bit more complex uh, tools and programs like Horizon that uh, Ricardo was introducing now is that any kind of registered organization can participate. And here for register, I mean any kind of uh, uh, organization that has some legal basis. I'm. Can you hear me well? Or at least well enough? Uh, that's good. Because sometimes I see you freezing, but it's good. And this registration process, I mean, once you have your, your registration as a legal basis in the country where it's based, the registration on the online portal takes less than 30 minutes. So it's all the bureaucratic procedures to participate in the program are meant to be as simplified as possible, at least in the EU, from the, an EU point of view. Also, in, for, that, for the same reason, the budget is organized by lump sums, by fixed amount, which means that you don't need to have an extensive uh, budgeting and research to... Um, ask for the money that you need to make a project, but basically in a way uh, it's considered that it's already calculated how much money will you need to do a specific action and that's what you get. So, which means that at the, at the end of a project, you don't need to report uh, to make a detailed financial report, uh, but that you need to report only on the content of, of the action that you implemented. Uh, of course, it's not that this doesn't mean that you can just do whatever you want. You need to keep your receipts, you need to keep your invoices and keep uh, a sound bookkeeping, but you don't need to present it unless you're asked to in a, in a desk check, which simplifies all the bureaucratic procedures quite a lot. Can you please go to the next one? Thank you. So, as I say, there are different uh, sectors, uh, and the one that have been practiced by Echo Village, which is the uh, network I'm speaking for, but in general, also a lot of uh, organization, communities uh, um, related with uh, sustainability and climate change, are the youth sector and the adult education sector, because they are related with informal and non-formal education, which is something that also, when David was talking about trainings and courses, it's something that a lot of organizations already do. So it's easy to combine those projects with uh, some funded uh, lines from, from Erasmus. And um, in these two sectors, again, I repeat, youth and adult education, there are uh, different uh, types of projects. Let's say, to simplify, those that go uh, under KA1, the key action one, that uh, deals with mobility of individuals and the key action two that deals with cooperation among organization. And just between these two uh, lines, funding rules, keeping what I was saying before as a general introduction, uh, the funding rules are, are then quite different. Um, I will now take a little, talk a little bit more about KA1 and then uh, Camilla will uh, take it from me to talk about uh, KA2. Just one more thing, just to, to mention that there is a COSIN program that works in a very similar way to Erasmus Plus, 
but that instead of uh, uh, education and learning is focused on volunteering, a lot of the tools and the logic behind is very similar and it's called the European Solidarity Corps. There's not really time to get much more deeper into that as well, but uh, uh, maybe in the Q&A session, if there is a specific interest on volunteering project, uh, we could also speak a little bit more about that. Okay, so KA1, a bit smaller projects for individuals, KA2, a bit bigger projects for cooperation among organizations and two sectors. Can we see the next slide, please? Okay. Two sector youth and adult education and there is this basic difference between these two so if you see the red dot the red dot means this is the organization that submits the application and receives the funding so basically uh, if you want to start uh, working with this uh, projects you want to be the red dot what does this mean that um, if you're working with youth you're actually receiving the funding which makes this project a good, uh, this, pro this kind of project a good tool, both for fundraising and for capacity building. While for adult education, and in the Erasmus Plus is good mainly for capacity building or for, of your organization, because you're receiving the funding to send your learners. So the arrows means that this is the learning mobilities. These are, these are the people traveling to learn something. The, the arrows. So if you are the red dot and you receive the funding in the youth sector, you're receiving the funding to have people come to your organization, come to your courses. In the adult education sector, you have money to send people. So this is the basic difference. And this is why, uh, if we can see the next slide, most of the organization focus at least in, when they're starting with these projects, with KA1 youth sector projects. These are, for example, youth exchanges, uh, which have this uh, opportunity, this uh, great uh, characteristic of being quite accessible projects, and this limitation of having a very limit, I mean, relatively limited age limits. So they're for participants between 13 and 30 years old. Then you see there are more details here. Maybe I don't go so much uh, in depth in what are the technical characteristics of which one of these projects. But yeah, basically you can see that youth exchanges are for younger people. Uh, they have quite simplified application procedures. Thank you. And, um, and there is a bit less money in them. While mobility of youth workers is another kind of of projects that you can apply also be in the same uh, K action and in the same sector of, of youth. There is no limits of age. There is a little bit more money, but also there are more requirements and, uh, and the um, application procedure and the reporting procedure are a bit more complex. Camilla, if, uh, if you want, I can pass it to you from here. Yes. Thank you, Dario. Yes, as Dario has explained, uh, some of the youth sector programs, uh, I can say that I am uh, maybe more into the adult education sector. And I think, as Dario said, uh, the idea about getting money through Erasmus Plus to send people out in Europe for education, it's something that we haven't in the Ecomilis Network been so fortunate to get into those kind of fundings. But some of us have, like, I've been to Club Jordan with Davy for a course, which was very nice that uh, we got Erasmus Plus funding to go. This year, I went for the last time to Schumacher College <laughs> because of Brexit, we can't go after January. But um, the idea that we can send people out and get new qualification skills, networks, and whatever with Erasmus Plus, I think it is very useful for all of us in, the, in this network. I like it a lot. Yes, <clears throat> but what I should talk about here is within adult education, the new modalities for small scale partnerships and cooperation partnerships, which I think is a modality that is excellent for the Ecolise network. Um, it operates on these lump sum uh, <clears throat> targets that you can get uh, in the small scale, 30,000 or 60,000 euros that you can use to meet uh, with each other, the whole European integration aspect, but also to run activities in your own countries. And I think that's one of the benefits of the new, new, new Erasmus Plus is that you actually can get more funding to do things uh, on the natural level, level as well. 
and then meet and exchange experience and so on and so forth. We can go to the next slide. And yes, and as we said before, maybe like the first steps if in Erasmus Plus is to run maybe a youth exchange and then also a small scale partnership, which is quite simple to apply for. I mean, these small one with 30,000 euros they are quite enough easy. You don't have to make much budget and just be a couple of partners to say, we want to do something together for the next uh, year or something like that. And then you can get 30,000 for it. It's a new and quite simple modality to intensify cooperation. So I think in the Ecolis network, I think it would be great also that, for instance, me being an eco villager from Gen Europe and so on, that we can maybe also try sometimes to say, okay, in Ecolis, we could work more. I mean, uh, with the different partners together in these partnerships and not just be in our own little gen circles as we sometimes tend to do. Then the next steps would be, yes, the mobility for youth workers <clears throat> or for adult education people to go out uh, is one, but uh, also, yes, the cooperation partnerships, the longer partnerships. And I think that's where we in, in Gen Europe with that cap on really has benefited from this Erasmus Plus. I mean, to have projects that run for like one or two years, where we really get to know to each other and can develop uh, quite substantial outputs actually. Like in, in Europe, we have clips for eco-villages, we have VCN for regional networks, and we are currently running a project called Launch and Thrive, which is about how to really launch and, and make uh, national networks thrive. So I think these Erasmus Plus projects can be quite instrumental as an organizational strategy also. Okay, we can take the next. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and Erasmus is constantly changing, and I think we've never seen something as focused on us in Italy's as now. So yes, more focus on the environment and climate change, where many other organizations, they'll have, they'll have to somehow invent all the green stuff. But we have it already. It's part of our DNA. And they mention all these uh, special attention to rural development. They mention these words in the program, sustainable farming, management, natural resources, and so on. SDGs are included and these kind of things. And even we can get money to take the train instead of flying, which is really something that we worked on for many years. And finally, it's also there. So I think for equally members and partners, I think the new Erasmus Plus is a really nice place for us to go and intensify our work together. Yes, we can go to the next. Yeah, these are the pros and cons, and I already mentioned uh, one of the pros for Gen Europe, at least, is that we have uh, developed these flagship projects, I would say, through the Erasmus Plus uh, uh, partnerships, um, which is now like part of our portfolio and our, I mean, what we can offer our members and so on. So I would say that it has really strengthened Gen Europe as an organization, as a network, but definitely also the, the, the individual partners that has been part. Uh, Dario, you want to? Go on with the pros and cons. Yeah, well, it's basically to sum up uh, things that we that you already were saying and also we were mentioning before. So that uh, the good, the really pros, uh, positive points about Erasmus is that it is quite accessible as a sort of uh, uh, EU funding and it has a relatively simplified uh, process of uh, writing application and reporting. As you said, Camilla, no, this priority of the new program on sustainability, on participation, on community building, these are our keywords and, um, and uh, evaluation points uh, that make our projects uh, come up the, the, the listings of, uh, of approved projects. Uh, the fact that it's very good for building international networks, share of good practices, strengthening our networks and, and, uh, and organization. And uh, and that and it goes directly in the line of a lot of the things that we do increases our impact and our outreach. The 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 cons, uh, as you see, are less than the pros. But if I had to mention something, it's that sometimes if an organization is really focused on having a local impact, it could take quite a lot of energy to do this kind of projects with not a lot of uh, uh, impact on the local on the local scale, at least for some of the projects. Uh, and also, no, and this idea that if we need to focus on young people, if you need to focus, especially for youth sector, is not such a natural uh, target group for some organizations, for others maybe it will be. Uh, and it's, uh, while it stimulates to, to focus on those target groups with 
which in my opinion are quite crucial, uh, it can be some like a kind of extra effort uh, to, to, to really put this target group. Uh, Would be good if you could wrap and, up, and Dario, group. just with timing. Yeah, uh, maybe there is still one slide. So, and I'm, and we're done, I'm done. Yes. So what are the lessons learned? And also Camila, feel free if you want to add something here, but uh, uh, you were also saying, no, this first step and second step, this idea of starting small to learn how the program works and then grow uh, to build a solid relationship based on trust with your national agency. Because something that I didn't mention yet is that most of the funding is administered, uh, administrated at local level. And um, so it's very good to have a to have uh, a, a contact with the technicians that uh, are in your country that administrate it to to build this trust relationship. And then, if you're a newcomer, you can get support to use expertise that is already in the network. Uh, some of the pictures that um, Camila was sharing are from a public a small publication that we have online that is called the Co Village Companion to Erasmus Plus and ESC. We did it uh, together with Davy and others while we were at Cloud Jordan last year, uh, collecting a lot of expertise that is in the network about these programs, and we're uh, happy to share it with you. I can put the link in the in the chat in in a second, and also specifically for youth exchanges. You can contact the Yes Sustainability Network. I even put a QR code if any of you are so technological and want to scan it. Or you can go at the link that uh, also Dan can put in the chat is a network of people that are organizing youth exchanges in eco-villages and sustainable initiatives and can offer support if you want to move your first steps in the program. Thank you. And, and one last little Thank thing is... Both. Very yeah, very one short. last uh, comment, Camilla. Yes, and it's just that uh, I think we've discussed it before that Gen Europe could host like a project development seminar for the Ecolese partners so that we could meet for five days, develop projects together, also especially maybe the, the partnerships so that we could uh, really dig into the Erasmus Plus and Ecolese together. I think that would still be a very valid idea. Yes, and I would like to be part of it. Yes, that's it. Amazing. Thank you for that at the end. An exciting idea and maybe something that can be also explored in the breakouts that we'll go to. Um, but last but not least, and not less interesting, we're going to go to Maurizio speaking about crowdfunding. And I think since a lot of our initiatives are involving a lot of people and collective and community action, it's also interesting to see how can we gather a crowd to financially you know, make these activities happen. So I'm curious what you will be sharing with us about crowdfunding. Okay. Over to you, Maurizio. I, I hope it's useful, first of all. It's uh, going to be a bit of an introduction of the purpose of crowdfunding. Uh, for those that you don't know our organization, we're the European Crowdfunding Network, a nonprofit organization. We're based in Brussels. We were built in as an independent organization, professional network for the crowdfunding industry, which is uh, sort of the fintech side. We are aimed specifically on how to innovate, promote, report the information that we that we could tackle from the key um, key players of of, of our different um, countries you know, all over Europe, and we are focused on the alternative finance side. Our aim and our focus: uh, we participate on the policy side, uh, participate in different European projects, proposals, depending on the focus, from Erasmus to Horizon to you, you name it, um, uh, interreg projects, it could be also interesting. We develop a hardcore part on trainings. You know, it's like one of the key aspects of what's about this of crowdfunding, how does it work? Different levels of, of skills, it's needed and required when you're launching a campaign or you're a promoter of a campaign. Another thing, if it's you are trained the trainers part um, to arrange how to to focus on what are the key aspects on developing a longer run uh, fundraising strategy within uh, crowdfunding um, scenarios, et cetera, et cetera, or even running a crowdfunding platform. You know, there's the, that sort of more profile on how to build that uh, IT infrastructure to, to run um, crowdfunding campaigns. We do a lot of research. You'll find a lot of reports uh, from our different, uh, from different topics and areas interconnected to philanthropy, to impact investment, 
to energy and community um, com energy communities. And we we have even you know um, on match funding, which would be a topic I would like to to point out, but don't don't go into much too much into detail. And we work for the for the side of the sort of code of conduct for the different platforms. You'll find a lot of information on our uh, website. Next uh, slide, please. Just give, to give you that main um, a scenario where to where to start from crowdfunding it uh, looks like a very you know like new brand new shiny digital tool but what the crowd and funding together has been existing for quite a long while the only difference is that nowadays the practice of crowdfunding is understood as that uh, getting impacted and fundraising thanks to a large number of people that each could hand in give out invest uh, small amounts of money in order to, to, to capitalize an initiative or a project. And normally it's done through the internet. It's one of those digital tools. It feeds in, and this is where uh, from prior crisis and when the banks were closing down their finance, uh, the alternative, sort of the alternative ways of getting funded comes with the sharing economy. Finance comes through and same thing happens. We start talking on how the internet, the digital structures could create other scenarios to collaborate. Uh, this is where crowd outsourcing, collaborating skills from a bigger audience and a bigger crowd, okay, or community, it gathers around for a duty. And this sort of down, goes down to how could we finance projects? How could we realize that together, like in the old, old days, especially in the rural areas, you could have a common goal that needs some funding to be done, and you're out, uh, outsourcing that rising, that capital for uh, that community support. Relative uh, things to, to be said, we could talk about a, pun, pun, um, and a specific sort of page that is your campaign, okay? It could be simple in your, in your website where you're uh, analyzing why are you calling for action or why are you calling for that funding? It could be actually part of a platform. Okay, this is where the portal, digital portal, or how do we connect to fundraising in our fundraising strategy? Because it's one specific tool that could be a piece of the puzzle. It doesn't mean that you have to entirely put it all into crowdfunding. And what goes beyond? And this is where I'd like you to go to the next slide, please. The benefits, okay, this is where you have to go and go beyond of what uh, crowdfunding does. It's not just about the money, okay, it prov provides an alternative tools to allow those promoters of the campaigns to do many other things. Okay, if you're initiating a project or you have this experience or you have this event or you got this thing going on in your mind that you say, ah, I would need the funding, first of all, Put it out. You get, get first. You will get validated if your project is successful. You know, you've got a seal of your community that is backing you up, thanks to the effort that you're putting in the crowdfunding campaign. Second, it's it's combinable. This is where you could be, uh, arrange the different types of funding in different moments of your project. When crowdfunding could be one of those tools of many many tools that there is for for fundraising because it allows you to. Obviously there is, when we get into the technicalities as, as, as it was pointed out before, sometimes, okay, you have to go into details. If you're a part of a European project, could you get fund, extra funds from any other lines? Probably not, depending on which one. But if you're actually going for a grant for a philanthropy side, could you combine it with crowdfunding? Yes, you can. This is where you're co-responsible with that philanthropy, your community, and your efforts to fundraise. You're expanding the collectiveness of your project. It's not about us, and it's not about me, it's not about I, it's about our entire organization. It's pushing through and thriving thanks to the financing part. Maximizes the impact thanks to the community. You're validating, you're communicating, you're empowering people to participate if they want to. If they could share the the values, the message, the tone that you're that you're putting out, if it's appealing for them, they will help you out. 
there is a moment in which there's a, a growth in, in that participation, which triggers thanks to that effort that you could put into a crowdfunding campaign. Next. Next slide, please. And it's about it's a crowdfunding, it's a toolbox because the word in itself contains different funding mechanisms from scratch, donation based crowdfunding, reward based crowdfunding, lending, or equity. Okay, each one of those obviously has uh, its focus and it has a different typology and a reasoning. If you're looking at donation based crowdfunding, you would, it would be more solidary action. Somebody that wants to fund a project supporting the mission of that organization just for the sake of it, like an NGO, directly as an NGO. If you're tackling your funding through a reward crowd base, uh, crowdfunding, some, if somebody is backing you up, they expect something back, a perk. You know, that's, that's an inter interchange, old fashioned, you know, pre, you could, it could be understood as a pre sale. It could be understood as in many ways in which you exchange for that 5, 10, 20, 50, 300 euros. What are you exchanging it for? These are non-financial tools. But when we go into financial tools, more understood as traditional, you have, for example, lending. Instead of going out to, out to a bank, you go to a crowdfunding platform that could access, give you access to a community or even the tools to, to fundraise or to lend money or even ask for money in the exchange of an interest. Okay, this is where old fashioned, very old fashioned style. And when we're talking about entrepreneurship or we can talk about that startups uh, that were pointed out before, uh, just, just earlier on in the session, we could talk about the equity side, invest in a share. You know, you're capitalizing that project, expecting that that project will be successful and will grow and eventually there will be benefits that you could also take advantage as a, as a stakeholder. And this question is, depending on each tool, it's when do I use it? It's an initial, am I consolidated? Am I expanding? I've got, do I have a very unique uh, need that I have to cover on a specific moment? This is where we have to sort of balance which ones of these tools could be useful for my organization or my entity or my idea. What does it, what, um, what for? You know, it's not the same if we are saying, okay, um, let's put it into, into, into practice. Okay, we could talk about energy in a community. I want to drive an event. I want to drive a, a talk or a workshop in which I could crowdfund to bring the speakers into my uh, my organization? Or is it about, I need to build an infrastructure? Okay, this is bigger. Maybe the budget is more, you know, it's gonna be more expensive. Or is it the study that I need to build that engineering before I, you know, sort of build the infrastructure? Why not? You know, it's like the service, you could cover many, many things. Um, and also we get into detail with the energy, you say, okay, uh, what is it? Out of consumption, you know, self-consumption, just for my organization, I want to produce and have an exceed of that energy that it could be distributed within the community. Is it a matter of, why not? Nonprofit organization wants to tackle energy poverty thanks to the construction of uh, energy community. That it could be a non-profit, non-profit contrast. But uh, this is where we have to switch and we have to be very, very precise in what we, we, what we want that funding for. Which is my impact? Always question it. It's not the same when we are talking about donation or reward or lending or equity, even by the amount of money that is raised by each one. We say the average numbers in donation would be 8,500 euros on a European level. Reward base, it could go maybe between 20, 25,000. When we were talking about lending, it goes beyond 100,000 or equity between 350 and 450,000 euros. Uh, the impact of that funding in our organizations could vary. We're talking about average numbers, but we could always highlight, I could always talk to you about uh, how projects, even in donation base, have raised. In, 30, 30 million uh, euros for Ukraine cause at the very beginning of the war. Uh, this is where we could analyze each case by case on what do we, do we aim. 
Next one, please. And if you're thinking, which is the right portal for me? Okay, um, which is that the door I want to knock? You know, every, there's over 600 platforms in Europe, different typologies of crowdfunding. They have a different ge geographic coverage. They could be local uh, platforms, even regional uh, platforms. They're working on a national level or a pan-European level. Okay, this is where you have to sort of go into detail and say, well, what do I want? Donation rewards, lending or equity. Where is the where do they work? Which is the type of projects that they support? Could is there anything I could reflect on? You know, this is where it's closer to my community or my knowledge of our of my community. We could say about the focus, okay, of those platforms. We have cases if we could highlight general uh, topics, they talk to anything into their their website. Or we could go into vertical uh, focus, which sustainability could, could be their main core of supporting projects. You could highlight those ones specifically and how could I reflect on them? Is there projects in that actual platforms where I could identify myself, where I could reflect myself? And they are already present in that website. Why not? Or those ones even... When we're talking about that fundraising factor and how to combine it with the philanthropy side, match funding could be a very interesting tool in which a crowdfunding platform could be already working on how to combine that common uh, goal that you have within your crowd and another second step in which which organizations could support me, private, private or public, through a crowdfunding campaign by arranging different types of match funding already existing. And last but not least would be the type of, of cost and uh, cost structure of those platforms. Success rates, which are the most successful ones, or which, which are the cost of fundraising through a crowdfunding platform in a specific. Next slide, please. And as, as coming down to earth, when we are talking about crowdfunding, does not erase every single tool, funding tool before even though we consider, consider that we are innovative, we're the new ones, you know, new kids on the block. We try to like sort of connect to what is already existing in those different funding tools that we've already seen in the session. How could it be used by Ecolease? Crowdfunding has different uses in its scales, as I showed you. It could be a very, you know, tailor-made proposal, depending uh, ad hoc to the organizations the type of organizations, the type of mission that they want to drive, and how they, that is that they could even focus and enrich that uh, focus on social innovation and sustainable goals. Why not? It's very easy to, to showcase um, scenarios. What are the pros and cons? And this is where I could extend it. I've seen, you know, cheeky ones who have extended each list, list of pros and cons. I want to, to go to to go to a specific. Uh, the cons. It is not an easy thing. Looks like uh, I could just boom. I press go to crowdfunding platform. I put my project in, and I'm good to go. Uh, 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 it's like a marathon. Fundraising is getting prepared, analyzing your strategy. Uh, you don't do a marathon from scratch and say well, I'm going to run forty kilometers on one go. And then I even haven't done my exercise first, not even a bit of stretching. You have to work it a bit, you know, work your strategy upon that marathon. As long as a crowdfunding takes, you have to communicate, you have to engage, you have to send out the messages. Awesome, to the Mario. Networks. If you could wrap up fairly soon, please. No worries. It's my last bit. So I'll go for that one. And uh, when we go to the pros, we've seen a lot of benefits. Okay. Highlighting, bringing the community together and to highlight some of the best practices and lesson learned on the crowdfunding. Sometimes you may think that rural and digital don't go together. Okay, this is where crowdfunding or sustainability could, could be in a very enriched background um, to highlight we're working on a, on, on a report that we're that once just in Spain will map out more than 300 projects that have been using crowdfunding. Uh, from our experience, which are we are a young industry, fintech industry, there has been a lot going on on the policy side and even at, at the EU level. 
and there's a new European legislation that would opens up the uh, completely the um, the interconnections within different countries platforms all over Europe and it's a game changer on that side for coverage for people it's a very reliable uh, sort of tools and and functionalities and mechanisms and we're more than happy to any other question just drive it out Ta -da! <laughs> a quick one wonderful thank you i think at this point we can stop the slide share we're going to go into the breakout rooms next um, i've created rooms for each of the four areas with the speakers um, you'll be able to choose which room you want to go into, and I invite um, one to raise Spark, you know, from the sharing that you want to maybe have clarification or further advice on what has been shared, but also two, if you have a specific project or idea that you would want to apply, you know, fundraising for, also bring that in and maybe we can, you know, brainstorm and um, explore some of these possibilities um, in the breakout rooms. So that's going to be our next step. And after the breakout rooms, we'll come together as a big group just to reflect on some learnings and wrap up the session together. So that's kind of the outlook for what we're going to do. And um, yeah, the, the four different rooms. So feel free to join the one that you feel kind of most curious about to, to learn some more and bring in your questions. And um, I'm gonna have them open for, for about 10, 15 minutes and then we'll gather to wrap up. So I'm gonna open them now. Uh, you should be able to see the option to join a breakout room on your screen. And let me know if there's any technical issues. All right, welcome back from the breakout sessions. I hope you had some juicy uh, conversations with lots of learning and good exchange. Um, so we're just entering into the final part of this session on capacity building um, with our fundraising skills, different speakers, lots of interesting participants. Um, thank you all for joining. And for the last piece, I would just uh, like to circle back um, to see if um, each of the, the speakers, if you have like a kind of one sentence highlight, not summarizing all the conversation, but something from your set. Um, I, I would need to be short. And then I also have another link to a Mentimeter to harvest some reflections from everybody here. Um, I'd like to hear also a few voices. I don't mind yes. um, starting if that's okay from just yes, a perspective exactly, yeah. from my side. I mean, I was looking mm -hmm. at earned income, and I think a lot of our permaculture, eco village type things, uh, initiatives in local places can be destinations. If they can be destinations, then they can offer training or events at that place. So, um, really building our capacity to demonstrate better and to build capacity in this sort of resilience and regenerative agenda that we're in might be a uh, one thing and um, one little uh, thing i want to link to after um, mauricio's uh, presentation on crowdsourcing we use open collective i don't know if anyone uses it it's an open source platform for fundraising for crowdfunding crowdsourcing and uh, it's used a lot by XR groups. It's really, I find it a really good tool and it's just been bought by the community. So it's it's an um, open collective, but thanks for the opportunity. I'll leave it there. Thanks. And I posted the link to the poll. So for everybody to share and also if you have further uh, ideas of how Equalese could help um, to enable more successful fundraising. That's the questions in the Menti poll. I would love uh, for, for you to take a moment to fill that in and maybe to hear, Ricardo, was there some, some highlight in your session? 
From my session, I can't really say specifically and, I'd say, um, and highlight the, the main thing that, that essentially we agreed to do because we brought different projects and intentions to the table. It's how do we work with them? And mainly the, the thing is to, to understand the networks better, to form networks, to find people that have been doing similar projects, to connect with people uh, that, that we can learn from uh, and start a project from there. So essentially to grow what we want to do by, by connecting with others. Okay, thanks. Uh, Maurizio, how about your session? In my session, probably I want to highlight the three the three pillars that any fundraiser strategy needs. You know, it's like how much money you're looking for, which is the top. The second part is the community that you're gonna like work with and how to balance that that need. And probably the third one, what many times we forget about, that is how to communicate the effort, the values, the interconnectivity that we have within those those three pillars. You know, so I will take it from there and especially when we're talking about working with the crowd and working with the community, it's about um, enjoying that, that, that success, that it's, it's, it's a team effort. You know, it's like a team sport. Okay. I see it so far there are not so many participants in the Menti. I would love for you to share some feedback and reflections there to follow the link. And then finally see uh, Camilla and Dario, if you also have uh, any short um, update from your session. I can go. Hey. Uh, Dario, no. you go. Okay, we're shy. Um, yeah, very briefly, we were a bit discussing about existing resources that are already in the network and ideas that could be replicated and how we can all support each other and uh, repeat also formats that were working uh, and uh, adjust uh, and uh, yeah, make the most of formats that were already working and used in different parts of the network. So I think this is a great support that the network can give and make uh, from the idea that Camila was bringing to have a joint session where we could, many of us could meet together and, and develop ideas together to also adapt other kinds of projects that were tried out already in the past and, and bring them in different parts of the network, adapting them. So yeah, I think the best uh, insight was this and also to use these resources that are existing. Mm. Thank you. All right, maybe we'll stop with the slides so we can end up also with the faces again. And I've posted the link again. Uh, maybe take another minute to share your response uh, in the Mentimeter poll, and then I will share also the results again. Together. So I'll give you one more minute to do that with the link. So far, we have just three participants, but 22 on the call here. So I want to see some more responses.
right? Give you another moment to your answers. Right, I'm going to share my screen to see. Okay, these are some of the responses here about the learning and takeaways, sharing stories, the network, state of mind, a few different ones here. Let's also see. Uh, Okay, some things that Ecolis could do to support is to connect with target groups and also give guidance and mentorship. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you everyone for sharing how we're gonna follow up also sharing the recording and the slides and um, send out a mailing and also other people similar type of sessions also in the next year. Let's see, but I'm, I'm happy there was quite a good interest um, in the group to join around this topic and grateful for our beautiful speakers to share your experiences and wisdoms. Um, of these different funding sources. Thank you for bringing that into this group and being open for, for dialogue and conversation and maybe some ideas so we can further strengthen our capacity and, and successfully fund the different activities that we all want to do um, in our networks and across different organizations um, or centers and for, for wrapping up. Um, but from my side, thank you all for the participation and engagement today. So thank you, everyone. And okay, I'm wondering if I missed the part where you asked me to say something, Laura, uh, with a connection mishaps. But I would say let's just uh, let's just close the session and thank you all for participating. Uh, we have a, a bit of follow-up. There's always a lot of funding, uh, fundraising work to do, uh, and yeah, and doing it together is better than uh, than not doing it together. So let's go for that. Thank you. Thank you for organizing. Bye. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye.